This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Healthy dogs. It's the healthy dog pod. Welcome to the Healthy Dog Pod. It's Sophie and Ian. Hello. As always. And today we have a special guest. We have Audrey Shen, who runs Aussie Mobile Vet, is also soon to be on Bondo Vet Coast to Coast, the new series, and Future Kids Vet Camp. Audrey, hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about Aussie Mobile Vet. Yeah. So I run a company called Aussie Mobile Vet. It's basically a mobile vet company with a bit of a difference. So our vets are equipped with a van that's sticked out like a consult room um, and it's got an onboard pharmacy, it's got an onboard lab and we also function as an ambulance. Um, so it's a bit different than your typical mobile vet you see out there um, and we bring the vet service, the complete vet service to people's homes. So that works really well um, if you've got multiple vet uh, pets or if you've got any pets that are anxious about travelling or waiting in the waiting room or just going to a clinic in general. Um, so it's taken off for the last six years. Uh Um, We cover most of Sydney at the moment, so we cover the inner west, the CBD, the east, as well as the Hills District and the Sutherland Shire. Oh, wow. So you travel a lot. Well, there's a few of us (laughs) in a few vans. Oh, right. I was going to (laughs) say. But yes, there is is a wide distance that we all travel every day, but we enjoy being out on the road. Yeah, and I I think it's a really good service as well for animals that, you know, maybe a bit phobic of the actual clinics themselves. I'm going yeah. to that we refer to Audrey for that reason. I was going to say, we deal with a lot of pets that can't go into vets yeah. because for that reason, they're dog reactive or people reactive or yeah. just anxious. Yeah, and I think the main reason why we, we set up the mobile service is for that reason. Um, my sister and I used to run a hospital for nine years and we saw that there was a big need for vets to actually go to the home because there were a lot of pets missing out on good veterinary service because they just couldn't get there um, or it was just too much of a stressful trip for the owner to drag their animal there. Um, So a complete mobile service was definitely needed and we came up with this concept and then launched it six years ago. Yeah, it's really cool. Sweet. Really cool. The vans as well. They just look great. They are great inside. Like, you you really... can fully stand up in it. It's like a mini office. Uh, you know, if I'm at home and I need to do some work away from the kids, I go to the van. It's <laughs> 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 nice and quiet in there. Little escape. <laughs> the kids are <laughs> like, where's mom? <laughs> She's in her office. <laughs> Why'd you really set up the business? <laughs> Needing an escape room. Yeah. <laughs> it is my escape room. <laughs> oh, I love it. So what kind of uh, animals do you deal with? So we're mainly small animals, so dogs, cats, rabbits, um, some rats, birds as well. Okay, so with the the dogs, what sort of, um, obviously dog aggression and things like that Mm. is really hard, especially when they're in clinic. And so what sort of point of difference can you bring to the service? Like when you turn up, like talk us through what what it would look like, things to advise the client to do, not to do. So we do see a lot of... Uh, aggressive or anxious animals that's pretty much the most part of our work Um, so we are quite used to being in that situation I think a big part of it is we we come into people's homes as well so we've got to make sure that the animal's quite relaxed a lot of the time for the first sort of 10 to 15 minutes we're not even touching the dog or the cat we're actually talking to the owner on the sofa so that the animal feels calm and they think we're just a visitor or friend Um, and then we will slowly approach the animal Um, in a friendly manner and and maybe try and avoid the situations where the owner tells us that the animal is going to be anxious or react. Um, We generally don't have as much time as you guys in a consult to make friends Um, and a lot of the times (laughs) we're not there to make friends, we're there to do some testing or to give it a needle. Um, So it does reach a point where we have to be quite quick with it Um, but if we can be as relaxed for most part of the exam, we, we try to achieve that. Um, dogs are a little bit easier than cats to make friends with. Um, a lot of the times <laughs> with aggressive cats, it is a bit of making friends and a bit of just getting in there quickly with the nurse and, and doing what we need to do. Um, but we have also got onboard sedation um, if we need it. So we've got that back up as well. What's the um, biggest like no-no? Like, as in, what would you tell a client like not to do? You know, obviously, if you're turning up to an animal that's stressed or you know is going to potentially cause harm to you. Yeah. What would you advise? Like, So usually we try to say keep everything the same as normal, uh, cat or dog. Um, sometimes keeping them in a smaller room is better rather than chasing them around the house because that 
tends to amp up the anxiety, you know, pulling them out from on the couches and by that time we're probably scratched or bitten. Um, so if they can keep them to a small bedroom or a small bathroom, uh, make it quite positive, put some food and treats in there before we arrive, um, that all helps with the exam. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the sort of thing as well as, as a trainer. If we know we've got um, a dog that isn't, is going to use your service or is even just vet phobic in, in originally, just some tips on like handling, like how to teach the owners not to like stress that dog out and make mm, it worse. Exactly. Like um, we work with animals that have to be muzzled a lot yeah. and people can well, just get that so wrong and consistently get that yeah. muzzled to the point where it's conditioned to be a stresser yeah. and it doesn't have to be that way. When we, when we teach people to, I always joke, like when we're teaching people to try and put their muzzle on, I'm like, just make it, make them feel like they're wearing their favorite hat. Mm. And, I like that. You know, you and just, that helps our job too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It goes hand in hand. Um, and that stress-free practice, I mean, chances are if your dog's got to see the vet um, regularly and needs a service like Audrey's, it will need it regularly. So let's just take the stress out of that situation. Yeah. It's a part of the animal's life mm. and it's meant to be where they're getting care. Yeah, and yeah. I think all those kind of little things help. And I've seen a few of your cases actually where they've come in and they've said, oh, I'm going to put a muzzle, I'm going to put a muzzle on and... They seem quite happy with it because I think it's been a couple of weeks of training, all of us working together before we actually go in for the vet visit and need to take bloods. Um, but also, I guess, us going to the home, a lot of the animals that I used to see in clinic that were very stressy or quite aggressive are completely different in their home environment. You know, we can literally take blood on the sofa, whereas in the clinic, they were too stressed by the time they got into our room, we couldn't even touch them. You know, the car trip, the cage, the waiting room, the smells, by that time, we've, we've lost it. Um, so I do enjoy this part of the job. It's it, I get to do a lot more with animals that I couldn't even touch before and that's rewarding in itself. Yeah, and um, like you say, like by the time they get even into those vets, the, the dog's so stressed you can't get near it. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, they don't know. When you turn up, they don't know who you are. And sure, you might smell a little bit like a vet mm. when, when you turn up, but essentially it's a, it's, it's a good experience from the off and you can then take that time, you can really yeah. build that positive association and build a relationship, really cool relationship with the client as well. Yeah. yeah, no, I love it. Like the relationship you have, you know, going into people's homes like you guys would know, you almost form a friendship. And it's funny because sometimes we'll have a bit of a laugh, we'll turn up and the dog will be so excited to see us, wagging its tail, you know, licking us all over the face and then it will kind of take a back step because it realizes that we're here for a vet visit so they don't know whether we're for a friend visit or a vet <laughs> visit they love us but they don't know and you know it, it, it's cute yeah yeah it's much better than turning up and going i bloody hate you yeah, i know yeah. where i am yeah. and i do not want to be here it's a love-hate relationship <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> so what's the uh future plans with aussie mobile vet are you future planning plans. on planning on getting more vans involved more mm. i mean you've got a great team already yeah, we would love to get more vans involved and more vets, obviously, um, you know, different vets servicing different areas. We like to keep the areas small so everyone in our local area knows what vet is coming. And I think that's important, that continuity of um, professionalism. So, you know, for example, if anyone in the inner west or the east calls, they know they're going to get Dr. Audrey. And we have that great relationship um, going. So we can get, you know, someone up in the northern beaches, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Get a vet up there who lives up there to get a van. Um, we actually just launched uh, a van in Brisbane as well so my sister wow. Alison is awesome. running that one um, but that one's gonna be a little bit different that one functions as a rehab van so it okay. does um, acupuncture laser therapy therapeutic ultrasound so there's all that you know holistic it's kind like of a ninja of all vans yes. That's awesome. yes it's our, it's our <laughs> rehab van we're very proud of it so it just launched two weeks ago and excited to see how that goes and oh, you wow. and you've also got a uh, really cool relationships with actual you know um, what's the word like veterinary clinics yes. just normal where you do more major surgeries yeah, around correct. Sydney yeah so that's another point of difference so every van and every vet has a backup hospital um, so we're all in hospital one day a week doing surgery on all our patients so not only do we just do uh, mobile medicine we actually do surgery um, so we pick up our animals we do the surgery and then we drop it home so it's a complete 360 um, service um, so yeah I, I actually operate out of my vet animal hospital in Waterloo and then we've got another one up in the Hills District Hills Animal Hospital another one down south and another one in Brisbane we need to get Dr Sonia in here we do need to get Dr Sonia she runs Hills Animal Hospital she's awesome yeah, yeah she's really brilliant. great vet really nice hospital yeah we'll get her in one day when she when she gets the confidence to come and talk yes <laughs> we'll, we'll have to drag her here <laughs> lots of, you might lots have to of hold coffee maybe <laughs> <laughs> lure her in with treats yes <laughs> absolutely just like one of the consoles yes. come yes. on you <laughs> 
<laughs> she gets in. Oh no, microphone. Oh no, vet. <laughs> um, I mean, I've worked side by side with you now for um, a couple of years. We've done Sydney Dog Lover Show together. Yeah, yeah, did a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but one thing I've never asked you is why did you get into this in the first place? What made you want, want to become a vet? What made me want to become a vet? So. I think it was, uh, I'm an identical twin, so both of us loved animals, so pretty much from a very young age, we were always trying to heal something or put an insect's wing back together or try and find something sick so we could heal how, it. How do you put an insect's wing back together? You sellotape it, but don't tell anyone. It was already dead. <laughs> <laughs> but we felt better and we were like six. Uh, but, you know, just that just that constant, like, that's yeah. how we played. We're, like, we're always trying to fix things and help animals and... It's just that innate interest we've had since we were young. And then as we grew up, we realized that would mean that you'd have to be a vet. Um, so then focused all our energy into getting the grades to get into vet school, yep. past vet school. Um, and then when we came out, we both worked in separate practices. And then our dream was always to open up a clinic together. So we did that a couple of years after graduation. Nice. Yeah, when, so where was that? That was in Five Dock. It was called Happy Tales Memory Hospital. Uh, no so we idea. opened that nine years ago, sold it, and then opened up Aussie Mobile Vet. Oh, really cool. Mm. That's so cool. Yeah. And I've only ever met your sister once. Yeah. And, um, she looks know. like me. Yeah, she does. <laughs> no, <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> the first time I met her, it was like across the room and I'm like waving and smiling and oh, she's just looking at me going, thought it was I don't know who this guy is. That was at is. the Future Vet Kids yeah. Camp. Yeah. 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 You were coming oh in to talk God. and I was like, there was this guy and he kept waving at me and I was like, oh, was that Ian? Because I'm sure he was scheduled on today. And she's like, yeah, he said, I, th I feel like I know you, but I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> you crew. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Lucky. I kind of told her about you already. <laughs> yeah. He's a weirdo. Oh, <laughs> just take it. It, whatever he says with a pinch of salt. Um, tell us more about Future Vets Kids Camp. Um, so, yes, that's exciting. Because um, obviously we've done that together. Yes. Couple of, well, independently, but along, I was there, you were there. Yeah, yeah. We were both presenters initially. Yeah. There. Um, and now you're taking it to another level. Yeah. So it's, it was initially run by a couple from Canada and they fly over every January to run a Future Vet Kids Camp. And it's a great camp. I wish they had this when we were young. Um, it's, it's not just a fluffy animal showing you the fun side. It literally goes through all aspects of animals, uh, not even veterinary things, you know, just handling wildlife, um, exotics. There's a lot of exotics. Um, and it splits into three age groups. The older kids actually even get to learn how to take blood. They learn mm. um, how to assess um, blood results. So by the end of it, these kids can literally look at a panel of blood and tell me what's wrong with the animal. They're that good. That's so um, amazing. They get to go to our hospital. They get to watch me do surgery one day a week. Um, it, it's awesome. The younger kids do slightly less than that, but they learn body systems. And then the really, really young ones do a lot of cool things like they visit a wildlife park. They get to hold snakes you know they uh get to talk to ian about behavior and it's, it's just amazing all the aspects that you see from rescue work to behavior work to veterinary work yeah it's a really cool camp like you say wish we had that when I we know. were kids i was just gonna say i'm so sad because i wanted to be a vet yeah but then i realized you had to get like 99 point whatever it is yeah <laughs> well that and they're quite yeah, no. realistic about that they're like you know it's really tough so if you don't get into vet school you can do all these things and other we, things we yeah need all different walks of life to do with animals and they get to see all the different things you can do with animals which is great i sent my kids there they loved it oh nice oh, really yeah. so good yeah, they loved so cool. it it was like the best camp ever so i forgot them. that they went yeah yeah that's so it's cool. weird when your kids are in camp you just got to pretend that you don't know them. <laughs> I they, not try your get, mom. they try and get all the perks. Like, this is my mom. <laughs> I get to sit in the staff room. <laughs> they're doing the same as me when I saw your sister, like, waving yeah, and, you, yeah. and you're just they're playing doing, dumb. They're like. doing that creepy wave. <laughs> you like, I don't know you. Go sit down. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. And mm. tell me what's, uh, what's going on with the future of this camp. So. Um, so yeah, my sister and I, were going to slowly take it over in the next couple of years and we want to actually run it more times of the year, so not just in January, probably every school holidays um, because it is quite booked out. The waiting list is ridiculous um, and then maybe even bring it interstate as well um, and maybe just increase that curriculum a little bit. We're trying to get in with more horse vets um, to oh, do cool. a bit more equine medicine, um, try and see some exotic vets as well, so see the different types of vets you can become. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. It's all exciting. It's all new. There's lots of work to do. 
you have more, uh, but we you don't love... mind doing a bit of work. Yeah. <laughs> seeing yes. how many how busy you are and how many projects <laughs> you like to, to run. Trying to combine all my passion, you know, kids, <laughs> animals. <laughs> Champagne. <laughs> Champagne. You know, don't they say could... you shouldn't work with um, children and animals? Yeah, I know. You have to be careful about that. It's a fine line. <laughs> yeah. Audrey just got that rule book and screwed it up. Yeah, and screwed it up out. and made it different. What's new? <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's what needs to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, on top of all of that, you obviously have been filming for. Um, Bondi Vet yeah, Coast to Coast. Yeah, that's fun. How's that? But How did you it, find filming? Filming's a lot of fun. It's actually not as intense because there's seven of us filming it. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different to the old Bondi Vet show. And what's great is you get to see different types of vets um, all around the country. Um, so Alison and myself are the mobile vet component. And then we've got another few GP vets, uh, ex- exotic vet, uh, emergency vet. And so it will bring a whole different dynamic. That's why it's called Coast to Coast because it's trying to show the different aspects of veterinary medicine and the different areas that we all work in. Um, but, yeah, it, we've been filming. You know, the filming takes place maybe once, one to two weeks uh, every couple of months, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I am actually on it <laughs> with my Don't rabbit. Be done it. <laughs> and I don't know how you do it because it is tough, and I was – distraught mm. um and even you know trying to get in front of the camera where i've been crying yeah you know i don't know how you guys just hold your emotions in like yeah. oh. i think it is harder for the clients i sometimes feel sorry for you guys <laughs> um when you're when you're kind of the vet i'm just kind of doing what i'm doing um but it's on yeah. camera and i may have to repeat it a few times um but i it doesn't really uh, make me feel uncomfortable because I just feel they're just filming what I do every day. I kind of feel sorry for you guys because there's all this emotion and, you know, we don't want you to feel intimidated by the camera. But it's just such an awesome show because it's so real. And even your your yeah. piece, which I saw the other day, that made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> and it takes a lot to make me cry. Um, so, yeah, it's a great show. I think as well, like, actually, you know, with the show aside, but being a vet in general, having to hold your shit together. Mm. every day every minute of every mm. day for the for your clients like whether you're being filmed or not that yeah. is hard work it is hard work uh, mm. i think that's that's one of the hardest things when you first come out as a vet um you know on top of all the medicine and all the nerves and things like that it's also trying to be professional and not be too emotional everyone wants an emotional vet they want a vet that cares about the animals they actually do like to see you cry you know when when it's a sad moment yeah. but at the same time you you do feel like you have to be stronger than your clients and your patients because you've got to add that professional element and you've got to be their pillar of strength when they've got to make a hard decision. Um, but all that comes with time. You know, I have a few new nurses. I've got Iona from Bondi Behaviour start up with us and she's yeah. like, I don't know how you do this. <laughs> like literally every euthanasia she's crying yeah. and then I'm helping her and I'm helping the owner and I, I know it's hard and it's funny when you kind of see someone new start up because I remember what that was like. Um, and You can put yourself in their shoes. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, you're such a tough bitch. You never cry. I'm like, I do cry. I'm crying on the inside but we can't all be crying because I've got to find the vein yeah. and then I've got to do this and I... You know, like we've just got to try and keep it together. But And yeah. she's a tough little cookie. and She's a yeah, tough she cookie. Um, so, yeah, it's been quite funny to kind of see her journey because she, you know, she's just that raw emotion and she's everything why we went into veterinary science. And, yeah, we have come a long way just trying to. I think as you know, we uh, we get into these this industry because we love working with animals. Mm. Um, and then when we're in it, we realise, yep, yeah, we're hundred percent are working with animals. But um, there's that whole client relationship side. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's t- it's tough on us as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've got to maintain that. Um, we've got to remember they're the ones that actually ask for help. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we're the ones that, as much as we're there treating the animal, mm. training the animal, um, we've actually got to be able to explain as well. To, uh, what's going on yeah you can't just be good with dogs and you can't just be good with the animals yeah. you actually have to have a skill set where you can communicate you can emphasize and yeah. empath- empathize yeah <laughs> i mean that's totally true like we always say a lot of the work is your relationship with the client not so much the patient because the patient can't talk so a lot of you know you getting the history and me getting the history of what's going on is the client and the client's perception of what's going on yeah um and then a lot of the treatment is also dependent on the client not the patient it's not like a child where you go you have to take your medicine and they kind of get it yeah the owner literally has to do it so yeah yeah it's, it's a big part of it how, how do you cope with burnout burnout burnout's huge in the veterinary medicine world yeah. i don't know if anyone champagne. knows it <laughs> champagne is great yeah i've been hearing a lot lately you don't want about... to become a functional alcoholic no. <laughs> <laughs> i've been hearing a lot about um vets burning yeah. out at the moment it's terrible i mean they're, they're calling it a bit of an epidemic um we have the highest suicide rate in any profession in the world um Whoa. 
yeah, I think they say one in 10, something like that. Um, and I personally have lost a few vet friends from it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, one of the first vets I ever hired actually took her own life as well. Um, and that was quite a wake up call. Um, I think what it is, is at all professions you'll have burnout, whether it's medical, uh, whether it's financial. Um, but the thing with vets, I guess, is the type of person maybe going to veterinary medicine and then the kind of workload and, and the kind of work stress all amounts uh, uh, adds up. Um, uh, you know, I was having a long discussion with my sister and my husband going, you know, burnout, you know, do we have burnout? And of course, there's days I come home and my eye am so tired. Um, I've had like shit cases all day. Um, it's been bad news all day. Um, but trying to have that balance where you come home and you can switch off is important. Um, trying to become a kind of person where you understand shit's going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. all you can do is make that shit better. <laughs> I think that's a big part of it. Um, the problem, I think, is when you come out of veterinary medicine, you're quite a highly strong person already. You want to do well because you've had to get these ridiculous grades to even get into vet school. So you know the type of person that's going to get the type of grade. It's going to be someone who can't fail. Um, and then on top of that, when you get into vet school, you can't fail the subject because you will have to retake the whole year again. Wow. Um, and you spend a lot of your holidays in vet school doing um, vet work. So we have a requirement that we have to spend this amount of time on this farm, this amount of time in this clinic. So the person coming out of vet school is almost the type of person who has to do well, can't fail, and spends all of their free time doing vet stuff. So I understand that it's it's necessary to to do all that to become you know a highly intelligent vet but at the same time when you come out I think you have to make it a number one priority to put other aspects of your life first and you know it's, I've spent five years trying to do that um, I've spent 10 years trying to balance children with work running a business and all of that um, and it literally is just training your frame of mind I think you also you know you also have a very good um, support network yeah support network is key um, yeah. I have an incredibly supportive husband um, I run the business with my sister and I have a really really um, good parents who will help me with kids and make sure that I get time out so all of those things are important so I guess the thing is surround yourself with people as well as other vets yeah other yeah, vets you, as well yeah you know, we all go through the same thing we have this right. great little chat on our on our network where we you know laugh about things stress about things you know if someone's having a bad day and they can't get around to doing something the other vets will jump in and help even if it's our day off um so yeah supportive network make that key i think it's um you say about like people that get in the industry and you know your your uh profession being vet stuff but we see we see it across the board i think people that um uh, what is uh, not this isn't everybody of course but uh there's a lot of people that get into this industry they love animals they really care about they're really passionate about yeah. something really emotive people um so sometimes as well they do it because potentially they're not actually that confident with people mm. um and they get into it and perhaps not on the same degree as in the vet scale but i see a lot of dog walkers dog groomers dog trainers doggy daycare people they um burn out in a different way and they get real frustrated and um, they get real angry at mm. people and end up with a finger pointing game um, yeah. rather and it's like it's not healthy and uh, that's something that we've tried to do from day one as trainers is actually have um, a support network like we've got I've got Sophie and I've got yeah. a lot of vet friends mm. um, and other trainers that we'd lean on like even if it's not to talk about a case even if, like mm. as in like something we're working with is to actually just go mate that was a bit crazy yeah oh the bloody hell are you doing yeah. like yeah. just just normalize it yeah but um if you don't have that i can see how especially when you've got the pressure of running your own business mm. you know we're all self-employed we're all actually it's, it's it can be real, real bloody hard and having those challenges like can th throw you off some days and if you don't have that support network yeah. around you it's um it's it's weird you know um, when I first started as, as, as a dog trainer, you know, I'd actually approach other dog trainers and I've got this uh, friend, Dom, she owns uh, the dog brigade and, you know, she's a friend now, but I remember when I first approached her and she'll laugh at this, but she'll, she was basically like, who the, who the fuck are you? Like, <laughs> why, why are, you, are you? And she thought I was a threat, you know, um, and it took actually just weeks and probably a year of like, I actually am not a threat to your business. I'm nothing. I actually just want to talk to you about cases. I want to learn from you. You do things slightly different to me. Yeah. And 
you know, at least you guys had a vet school mm. where you had a support network like of people that you studied with and everything. Mm. We come into this industry on our own and we go, oh, everybody sees me as competition. They yeah. don't even want to chat to me about it. I remember reaching out to you. I was shooting myself. I sent him an email through uh, Becky from Pawsome. And she was like, yeah, just email Ian. Like, you know, and I thought, oh, no, Bondi behaviorist. I live in Bondi. He's going to think I'm trying to steal mm. his business. When you think about it, there's so many dogs out there that, you know, he can't take them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just reached out to him and said, hey, can we catch up for a coffee? Mm. Five hours later, we're at the pub having a drink yeah. <laughs> at Bikini Bar. <laughs> and Great business venue, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and we just got on so well and it was just so nice to have someone there to just be like, hey, I've got this really hard case. I'm not sure what to do or be able to refer him. And then he introduced me to all other trainers and mm. walkers in the area. And it's just so nice to have someone to lean on because I think my partner's sick of me talking about dogs as well. Mm. So it's nice to have someone else to call up and, and speak about dogs. It actually with. knows what you're going through. Like yeah. your partners, um, they can try and support you as much as you want, but you actually can't vocalize like what it is you're going yeah. through that's what you're exactly your twin must yeah, yeah. You, you, sometimes you, in our dinner conversations with my family are just disgusting we'll sit there and we'll rant on i think the other day i was coming home and i just did an amputation of a toe had cancer on it and i came home and i dumped all my stuff on the dining table and you know my family was having dinner and i'm like oh I've just had such a tough day and they're like what is that in the middle of the table I'm like oh yeah it's a toe tumor and so we're passing it around the table and as looking, looking at, at it, it like oh yeah do you think <laughs> and we just stopped and everyone was just like what are you doing I'm like sorry yeah this is really inappropriate isn't it this you know when you lose what's appropriate and what's yeah. not appropriate we have lost what what's Keep appropriate in dinner room. discussion <laughs> um, and yeah there's my oh. daughter Running around the room, I'm like, okay, stop over dramatizing. Used it by now. Yeah, stop over dramatizing. <laughs> She's at that age of ten where everything's drama, and that's yeah. cool. You know, everything is dramatized. So oh, that's cool. So that helps during the dinner conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Got the ten year old running around. My parents telling me off for putting a toe on the table, and me and Asin in deep conversation about toe tumors. <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. Do you, um, speaking of twins, mm. do you get any like? Twin stuff twins happening. Oh, I know everyone I'm, asks I, oh, me. I know. I knew you were going to get this question. But my <laughs> sister, she's like obsessed with like yeah. twins and twins. finding out if they have all this we stuff. We definitely so. <laughs> do. Um, I think a lot of it is probably just hanging around each other a lot. But we're very twinny twins. So we <laughs> grew up together. We did the same subjects in school. We did yeah. the same university degree. We lived together. Um, so we're pretty close. Um, and I think a lot of why I can finish her sentences or she knows what I'm thinking before I even say it or we just give a look is because we hang around each other so much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you want a little bit of a spooky story. Oh, tell, tell, tell. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, we can dream of the same things and talk no. to each other. <laughs> Get out. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Hang um, on. What do you just wake up and say, did you have that dream or yeah, something? Yeah. No. But the only, the reason we, how we discovered this was um, when we were younger. So we used to have bedrooms opposite each other. And my parents, when they went to bed at night, would go, oh, I feel like you were dreaming about the same thing because you were both screaming. And then we were standing in the middle of the hallway and you were screaming <gasps> something. And then Asim was like replying to you. And it, it went on for most of the night and they were freaking out about it. So when we woke up in the morning, they were like, hey, you know, what did you dream about? And most of the times I can't remember, sometimes I can. And they were always asking us questions. And then when we were chatting about it, I was like, hey, I kind of had that dream. And I was like, yeah, you were in my dream. We were talking about this. I'm like, no, this is, this um, is really weird. I have goosebumps. <laughs> I have goosebumps. Um, that is freaky. Oh, my God. Um, and yeah, there's been a few, like, we don't talk about it much anymore, but there's been a few times where I've dreamt about her. And I'm like, hey, were you dreaming about me last night? So... That's pretty cool. Oh my Does God. it? Uh... Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I love it. But we're completely normal. <laughs> yeah. Well, define normal. You know? <laughs> what is normal, really? <laughs> and like, I suppose that relationship owning a business together is really cool as well. Yeah. If, if you're that close and mm. you're probably on the same page 90, 90% of the time. That's I'm right. I'm say every time. Yeah. It's like, it's. You know, when you own a business with someone who thinks like you, um, you know, we, we share the load because we know how the other's feeling. It all helps. And, you know, when that, someone's going through an up and down in life, the other one just takes over and you completely trust them. Um, that's, that's great. That's nice. That trust, yeah. that, that word. I love that word. It's just nice to have somebody in your yeah. life that you can fall back on that much. Yeah, exactly. 
So a lot of patients that you work with um, are older patients, mm-hmm. older animals. Yeah. Um, just tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you care for them and um, if there's anything we can help um, prevent issues that occur. Yeah. Um, so certainly, I mean, we do puppies and kittens, but a lot of the mobile work is older patients or sick patients, um, palliative care and just managing um, general diseases. So I am quite passionate about older patients and picking up things early, making sure that if there is the start of some signs that are worrying that we get on top of it. Um, you've probably heard the the prevention is key, that phrase being said a lot, um, but not even prevention, just even managing cases early is key. Um, so if you've got an older dog or an older cat and it's starting to get kidney disease or liver disease, we may not be able to stop it, but we may be able to slow it down. Um, and all of that depends on when we diagnose. Um, so I guess... If we were chatting about, you know, what are the key things to look at if you've got an older patient, when should you call the vet? Um, getting old, things will slow down. And a lot of people will say, ah, oh, it's just slowing down. It can't see as well, it can't hear as well, oh, it's just sleepy. Yes, that may be a big part of getting old, um, but being very lethargic is a big key um, signal for a lot of disease processes. Another big thing that you hear vet talk about is drinking more and urinating more, or we call it PUPD. Um, if your pet is drinking more, that is a huge sign that something could be going on. Um, we are always ask that in every single consult. You'll hear me say, so is it drinking normal amounts of water? Um, the reason is diabetes, liver disease, kidney disease, um, hypothyroidism, Cushing, those are all disease processes where the animal will want to drink more. Um, and even if your animal is in discomfort or pain, they may drink more as well. So certainly, you know, have a look at if you're filling your dog or cat's water bowl more often than you used to, um, there are all these figures that they give you like 90 mils per kilo. Don't worry about that. If you're finding that you're filling up the bowl a lot more, like two or three times more than what you used to, that's significant. If you find when you're taking your dog out and it's peeing long, big peas or it's peeing more frequently, that's significant. Um, or for a cat, if the litter tray is getting filled up like ridiculous amounts and you're having to change it more often, those are key factors. Um, so certainly if you see that, call your vet, get some blood tests done. A lot of these things can be picked up by one blood test, even one urine test. It's so simple. Um, and if you if you tell us that you know your dog's slowing down or it's drinking more or it's not going to the toilet normally, we'll do the test and we'll pick up like 80% of the problems. Um, so one, one blood panel will pick up liver problems, kidney problems, thyroid problems. It's pretty good. Um, and even just a simple urine test, if you can't take blood from your animal, that can pick up kidney disease. Um, so things like that that are so simple and so easy to pick up, definitely give you a bit of a common sense approach as well. Rather than yeah. going by the numbers, you know, it's like if somebody somebody asked me, you know, how much do I feed my puppy in pup, uh, puppy school? I'm like, mm. look, just go with your best best feeling. And if your dog's getting fat, like it's, you're feeding it too much. If it starts losing weight and mm. you're not feeding it enough, you know, yeah. the, the, the thing, the guidelines on the side of the yeah, pack yeah. are a little bit, they're guidelines. Yeah. So you know your dog yeah. and you know your animal better. So if he's drinking more, it, they're, then it's abnormal. Yeah, yeah. You've got to apply concepts. And I hate kind of giving figures because then you, I just imagine this crazy owner just measuring everything that it's drinking yeah. and weight. And Absolutely. you can get these really cool bowls that measure everything because that's, that's... Yeah, and people love a detail, yeah. but at the same time, you know, <laughs> nothing better than a bit of common sense. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, I fill up this bowl three times. That's a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> Let's call Audrey. <laughs> yeah. That's a red flag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, they, so that's fantastic. So they're just these little insights into yeah. like what can we do as preventative care. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you say, uh, like getting older does involve slowing down, but mm. it's much the same in people. You know, you see these people that they look after themselves, they take care of themselves, and they're full of life. Yeah. And you see somebody of the same age, yeah, not necessarily looking after themselves and feeling really lethargic. Yeah. And it's it doesn't have to be like you just fell off a cliff just because your dog hit nine yeah. years old. Yeah, it's and there's there's these weird behaviours that animals will do, like cats. I had this client call the other day and said, oh, my cat's howling all the time at night. You know, maybe it's just going blind because it's getting old. I'm like, yeah, it could be. Oh, can you give it some behavioural drugs? I'm like, but it may not be. Um, we do a blood test. It's got hypothyroidism. It's mm-hmm. blood pressure's through the roof. So it's howling because it feels really unwell from the blood pressure. It's damaging the back of its eyes so it can't see properly. So if we'd just gone down, let's give it behavioral drugs, we would not have picked that up. Like just a simple blood test picked all of that up. We start the medication, within a week it's back to normal. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, always check. I think um, in the future we're going to do an episode around um, uh, early onset of stress, so fiddle behaviors and comfort behaviors. Mm-hmm. And um, something I, I kind of not been studying but looking and watching and just 
watching patterns over the years. And um, comfort behaviors happen when the dog feels slightly uncomfortable. Mm. And it could be, we, we use it in our training for um, l- watching the early onset of stress. And so it's probably a trigger. And in dog training terms, it's really easy. Dog in front of it, starts to fiddle, make it more comfortable. But we can apply the same, um, what's the word? We can uh, process to physical pain um, as well as emotional trauma. Mm. So when your dog um, is drinking, it is a feel good. Like we, it actually does make the dog feel better emotionally. It, it feels good. And so same with uh, scratching. Like I've got a, a little nick from a dew claw on my, on my arm at the moment. It's getting a lot better. Now, if I get slightly uncomfortable, I will fiddle and I will comf- mm. I'll do a comfort behavior and make myself feel better. It release, releases endorphins to, co- to cope with the stress. I don't scratch anywhere else at the moment other than that little itchy bit on my arm. Mm. I don't scratch them anywhere else. And that's like people can look at it and go oh you know it's just a little nick yeah but it's also the body um subconsciously communicating this is where you're uncomfortable Hmm. so the other day you know if i'm working in the consult and i can see that this dog i come in and the dog's uncomfortable because i'm there and she starts biting her butt and when i ask the client like it's a fiddle it's a really obvious fiddle and then when i but when i ask the client she goes oh yeah she's got allergies on her butt Hmm. like yeah i know but she wasn't doing it before i arrived and once I calmed it down, mm. it wasn't, it didn't carry on. So this is how to watch your dog, like notice fiddle behaviors. Fiddle is behaviors. like licking the paw, chewing, that's a big thing. Of chewing course. the paw, licking the paw, and we always get a call in, like it's it's constantly chewing. And I'll look at the skin, I'm like, yeah, it's a bit dry, but it might be allergies. And then we'll start the allergy track and it doesn't really get better. I'm like, mm, I think it's behavioral. Exactly. Um, and that's where having a, uh, a um, an approach of see the vet, mm. see the trainer, you and and a trainer that understands behavior isn't just there to teach sit and stay um because it could be one or the other yeah it could or be both. one could lead to both yeah we yeah. see that like initially it had a cut on its paw and it chewed it um and then we got it better and then it just turned into almost like it it's just a place that it licks when it feels nervous or whatever so working as a team i think is important like you know if if the vet says to you i feel it's a bit behavioral and it's a bit medical which i say a lot it's both of us working together. So you need a behaviorist, you need a vet, target all aspects of it and nip yeah. it in the bud. Yeah. And we tend to normalize um, bad health. We think, oh, you yeah. know, it's just, uh, it's just, it's, but it's, it's just itchy. I'm like, yeah, but your animal's in discomfort. Mm. Look after it. Mm. And if it's a physical thing, go and look after its pain. Yeah. If it's an, if it's a trauma or an emotional thing, remove the stress, like de-stress it. It's mm. simple, but don't normalize it. Um, and that sort of thing, when we're looking at our older dogs, can really, you know, we normalize the dog deteriorating yeah. because of age. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. You can take a lot of care and prolong that dog. And also in the form, last years of its life, yeah. improve its quality people, of life. I think people get used to that. They go, oh, it's just old. That's why it limps. Yeah. And you kind of go, okay, oh, it's just old. That's why it just kind of stares into the ceiling for ages. Um, <laughs> no, that's dementia. Or like people, yeah. or people go, oh, it died of old age. And in my brain, that, that just annoys me. Yeah. Like, like my husband says it too. Oh, it just died of old age. I'm like, honey, you don't just die of old age. You die because something stops working yeah. or yeah. something's not functioning well. Um, but it's it's just that phrase that we use and it's just become, it's old. 100%. It's old. There's a few phrases like um, when somebody says to me, oh, the dog will grow out of it. I'm like, your dog will <laughs> grow into it and you will normalize it. The dog yeah. doesn't just grow out of it. It's a human thing though, to just normalize things, make yeah, ourselves feel better What's about... that word? Anthropomorphism. Well, uh, what? I love that word because I can't say it. <laughs> the, human, the human mind... <laughs> <laughs> me neither. I'm not going to try. You should hear Anthrop- me in the conversation. <laughs> say anthropo- uh, uh, anthropomorphism. Yeah, oh, there that you one. go. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. You didn't write Sophie's definition say down it. this week. <laughs> 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 we, um, we don't like... Our minds don't like uh, open ends. Mm. Um, so we will conclude. And even if it doesn't mean that we're correct we like conclusions Mm -hmm. and we tend to just because we've concluded it we become okay good we'll move on from that and Mm. so it's just old age and I think it's easy because animals don't say anything. They're not like kids where they whinge. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. just, <laughs> well, that, <laughs> you know, you can't ignore the kind of kid that's like, going, yeah, and there's nothing there. Correct. Yeah. And like, it's not until they start communicating in a manner that like verbally, mm. like my dog's howling. Yes, he's also been scratching his butt. He's also been over itchy <laughs> for two years. Yes. Like, listen to your dog. Because you say your dog's not communicating. Mm. It is. It mm. is. But, and we know that's that. We know how, yeah. yeah, we need to learn how to listen to it. Um, the other one that gets me is, um, oh, the, the saying like they'll get used to it. Like that doesn't mean it's going to go good, well. Mm. Like, you know, mm, I'm exactly. u- it's just like you used to seeing your dog scratching its ass. It's like, doesn't mean your dog is 
good at like like scratching its ass mm. is that doing it for a reason getting used to it is always a good thing yeah the owner's getting used to it yeah absolutely. <laughs> there yeah. you go yeah <laughs> yeah that's what happens that's the process mm. um yeah so as as dog owners and you know all animals really but being the healthy dog pod pool i keep bringing it around to dogs um we uh we can do a lot to help the vet and the vet can do a lot mm, to help exactly. us and i love that relationship we, yeah. um, we work well together yeah i think we worked really well in the past you know if you've sent an animal my way i can see that you've gone through tips already of how to keep the animal calm uh, and i think that's that's a good point if anyone's thinking of using a mobile vet service because of behavioral issues or your animal isn't great going to a vet see a behaviorist first give ian a call there's huge tips they can do just to make the whole consult easier, less stressful, um, a lot easier for us. Something as, well. as simple as you know, teaching people how to create a calm association at the front door. Yeah, because mm. the front door is a highly emotive thing. Yeah. You know, um, so make it positive. Mm. You don't need that dog's um, adrenaline firing when, as soon as the vet gets in, because the the vet uh, the dog's going to be taking memories of everything that happens. And if we can t- create like calm and positive experiences at the end of the day like you like you said earlier it's um probably when you turn up not going to be all positive mm. for the dog mm. so making 99 percent of it positive and then that little needle in the ass yeah. a negative <laughs> it kind of hopefully can outweigh it yeah. and <laughs> it's so funny because we try and make it positive and then there's this o- always this awkward moment where i kind of look sideways to the nurse and like yeah. Yes, we're gonna do it now. <laughs> <laughs> and, go. and that's it. Like little little things like uh, you know the needles come in, and if the dog is nervous about hands in its personal space, and like the back end is more vulnerable mm. than the front end, mm. so a lot of dogs are bum shy. That's a terrible term. Um, but it, <laughs> <laughs> but and we uh, have to stick a thermometer out there. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so you can practice before the vet even gets there, like yeah. massage tips, treats, and like counter condition, make it make it positive. Heaps of things that we can do mm. to go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and same with like smells, I guess. Like mm. if you like going back to the muzzle, make, get them introduce a the muzzle before the vet gets there. Mm. Even we for try a... not to smell vetty. Yeah, <laughs> I make sure I take a shower before I go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the start of the day. <laughs> Good luck with that. Actually, this is funny because we were talking about this. If we have like a cat day where we've seen cats all day and none of them have been very happy with us, by the time we come to the last cat, it's like we walk in and it knows. Mm. It can just. I don't know, smell the other cats, smell the fear, whatever it is. So it is true. It's it's definitely, it's yeah, it's the pheromones. And we've got this feely way spray that's a positive pheromone. We try and spray that. But most of the time I'm just like, we just have to go home and change because I feel like every cat consult we're going to, they're already sensing that we've done something naughty to the previous cat. So sometimes I just go home and I change. And that's, that's such mm. a big difference between yourself as a practice and a veterinary hospital mm. because that pheromone will build up. Yeah, inevitably, and you and know, that's why the waiting room you lose fifty percent of them in the waiting room because they're just yeah. I don't know what they're smelling, but they're smelling something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're probably hearing other dogs and yeah. other animals as oh, well. It's the whole yeah, yeah, upping it up and yeah. That's yeah. another quality point of your service there. Mm. Um, okay, guys, so that is about us for today mm-hmm. thank you thank so you much for coming thank in, Audrey. you it's been lots of fun nice chatting we will be hearing from you in the future i'm sure and yeah. uh, we'll get you back in definitely we want to hear all about more about future vets kids camp yes. once it's up and running yeah and, um, i'm excited more about Brisbane and this ninja van. Mm, yep, we'll keep you posted. Definitely. Can you put that on the side? <laughs> ninja van. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for, uh, so much, everybody, for listening. Please send us in your questions. Um, we'll be putting up uh, heaps of information alongside this on the day. And um, remember, a healthy dog's a happy dog. Woo. And that was the pod. The healthy.